Her financial advisor, Andre Mayer, proposed that Ari pay $20 million to make the marriage happen. Your client, Onassis told Mayer, could price herself right out of the market. Jackie wound up getting $3 million up front from Ari. That's come down from that $20 million. Another $1 million for each of her children and $600,000 a year for travel, millions more in the event of divorce or Ari's death, and stipulations as to how many times a year she would be required to sleep with him. Wow, this is really a love letter, isn't it? I'll marry you for $3 million. Uh, you need to give me a million each for my kids, 600000 a year for travel, and there has to be something in this contract about how many times I have to sleep with you, you little garden gnome. Hello, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cheer Denise. Today we're going to keep on in the Ask Not book and we're continuing on in the Jackie story. But she's not Jackie Kennedy anymore. In this chapter, she's going to become Jackie Kennedy Onassis. And what was she thinking? Of course, I wasn't alive at the time when she married this man. And so I had not lived through everybody's collective gasp uh, that she would choose such a terrible man to be her partner in life. And I would say that these were the bleakest of her days. If she thought sitting in the back of a car and having her husband's brain shot all over her, she had yet to live through a marriage with Ari Onassis. So, uh, this was an eye-opening chapter for me, to say the least. I didn't know anything about this man. I didn't know anything about her. All I knew was that just later in life, she married him. And I think I kind of knew that people weren't like huge fans of it, but I had always thought it was because they just hated to see her move on. You know, that Camelot is truly dead now. You know, she's not a, Can she's not a Kennedy anymore. You know, that's what I thought growing up. That was people's disdain and dislike for the choice. I, I didn't have the wherewithal to dig into that story. There's just so many things to worry about. You can't worry, you can't worry about why did the world not like, you know, her second husband. But anyway, after reading this chapter, I was blown away. Like, I, I, I can't even figure out why she did this. I mean, money? But I... <laughs> I just don't think that she was that shallow. I, I, I just don't know. I just don't know. I did not know half the things about this man that are going to be revealed in this chapter. So, this is it back. It's going to be a doozy. All right. The book begins by saying that Ari Onassis was a Greek shipping magnate, a billionaire, an anti-Semite, a Bulgarian, and a bisexual with a string of bought and paid for young men that he savagely beat after sex. Well, that's an opening line. On October 17th, 1968, he and Jackie Kennedy, a 39-year-old to his 62, announced they would marry in three days' time. All of this would just shake you to your very core if you knew, if you, if you had known Jackie, you would have just been like, what? You got to marry anybody? Why him? The headlines on the world's paper were aghast. Everybody was horrified and everybody said, it's for the money. It's for the money. I mean, there's no other reason that she could marry this old man, this disgusting old man who was known, apparently. I mean, did people know this, all this stuff about him? I think they knew he was a Bulgarian. Probably didn't know that he was over there savagely beating men after sex. You know, <laughs> kind of one of those things. It's probably not like a public information. But the newspapers of the world announced her with headlines like, the reaction here is shock, anger, and dismay from the New York Times. Uh, in Germany, all the world is indignant. In England, Jackie weds blank check. In Stockholm, Jackie, how could you? The Atlanta Constitution said Jackie fell for Onassis plus yacht. And in Rome, they said JFK dies a second time. Apparently, the Vatican denounced her. Jackie Kennedy, the faultless widow and America's most admired woman, was no more. Jackie Kennedy was talked and written about as a prostitute who sold herself on the global marketplace, an unscrupulous viper who had stolen her sister's lover. Well, this part was true. That's what I'm saying, you guys. It's like, Jackie Kennedy, like, everybody wanted to act like she was just this angelic being that had fallen from above, you know. And unfortunately for her, she'd gotten caught up in the Kennedy machine, and that poor angelic creature had had to, you know, rally her strength for this beautiful funeral, and, and you know, she, she could just do no wrong, poor bride of Camelot. Look, I think she had a ton of redeeming factors. I think she was you know, a great person in many respects, I'm sure. But we cannot pretend that she did not have her own sexual twistedness because she did. And this whole book is like, Jack, 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 nasty old Jack. But <laughs> she 
did steal her sister's lover. So if people were like up in arms about it, it's it wasn't a false story. The book says that Lee, still married to the Polish prince Stanislaw Radziwill, had been involved with Ari and was hoping to marry him till Jackie became the world's most famous widow. And this was something Jackie and Lee had in common with the Kennedy men, an incestuous tendency to compete for lovers and sometimes share them. Jackie felt certain that she and Lee would get past this, less so as to whether America would forgive her. Jackie's psyche was not part of the national conversation, nor was her trauma after Bobby Kennedy's assassination four months prior, which she had predicted. Bobby had not died instantly, as Jack had. He was conscious after he was shot. Later in the hospital, the doctors broke the news that Bobby was brain dead. It had been Jackie who persuaded Ethel to turn off the machines. She had been the strong one that day, too. But in the weeks to follow, Jackie was experiencing episodes of psychosis. She would be in her apartment at 1045th Avenue in New York, and suddenly Jack and Bobby were alive. But Jack was Bobby, Bobby was Jack, and both were her husbands. Then she would be in the back seat of that Lincoln Continental with Jack, holding his head and his brain matter before finding herself in that Los Angeles hospital beside Bobby and the respirator. She was having nightmares, vivid and unceasing. Most days, she couldn't get out of bed. She was as inconsolable as ever, reminiscent of the months after Jack's death, when little Caroline told her school teacher, My mommy cries all the time. I mean, like, let's have a human perspective here, you know, instead of me sitting over here like a ghoul gawking at this poor lady. I can't even imagine how she managed to take another step in life. You know, the things that she experienced in her short life, when you look at everything that she had experienced, just one of those tragedies would have bowled most people over. Like, first of all, the tragedy of being married to somebody who is this sex addict and is running around with all of these people. And like she said herself many times to various people that she was not naive. She knew what was going on. So that would be tragedy number one, living in a marriage where you felt like you had to compete for your husband's love and attention. Tragedy number two, obviously the assassination you know, literally having your husband's brain matter splattered all over you. I don't even, I couldn't even come back from that. Like I would just be a shell of a human being, you know, but for the hand of God, I would just be like a mental case after that. And then to have this family member that she was very close to, let's just look at him right now as just a very close family member who had been there for her through many of the tragedies she'd experienced, what with the stillborn baby, uh, Arabella, um, who had been there by her side when she had to bring back the body of her husband from Texas. It's like, this man had been with her constantly in her worst moments. So you would have bonded with him regardless of, you know, any nefarious gossip about what kind of bond that was. Then he's assassinated. Considering the fact that she had been uh, treated by Dr. Feelgood for so long with, you know, a variety of concoctions, whatever they might be, speed definitely being one of them, where would your mind be? How, you, you couldn't even get any rest because you were constantly trying, they're trying to medicate you so you could sleep. You know, she's drinking. It's all of this stuff. Um, of course, she went to her apartment and saw both men and couldn't figure out who they were in her mind. I, I feel like that's like the most natural thing in the world that would be like would come next after all of that and all the drugs and all the alcohol to try to get you through all of that. Yeah, you'd be seeing folks right, left and center and you'd be crying all the time. Bobby had been more than a brother-in-law to Jackie. Before his assassination, in the wake of Jack's death, the two of them destroyed and disconsolate, they had become romantically involved. It began not long after Jackie and the children relocated to a Georgetown townhouse on 3017 North Street. Unable to afford the mortgage, Bobby negotiated the price down from 215000 to 195000 and had paid 100000 from Kennedy family funds. But the help he gave her wasn't just practical. It was Bobby alone who could rouse Jackie from her grief, from sleeping her days away, from drinking and weeping and fearing ever going outside. She told Franklin D. Roosevelt Jr. that she couldn't find slumber at night despite all the sleeping pills she took, that her medications did nothing to stop her mind from obsessively re replaying the assassination. She told Roosevelt that Bobby Kennedy was the only person keeping her from killing herself. Yeah, I feel like any normal person despite the fact that you would have two small children who depended on you, because that, that would, to me, be the thing that would keep me alive, would be that I can't leave my kids to this world alone. Um, that whatever pitiful help I can give them, I have to try to shepherd them through a world that would come at you guns blazing and kill you in the back of the seat of a car. You know what I mean? It's like, I couldn't leave my kids to that kind of world, regardless if I wanted to exit it. But I just don't see how anybody would be able to 
experience all that and think, I, I have to have a rest. I can't take this anymore. You know, I don't blame her for feeling this way. For Bobby, the same was true of Jackie. He had been the sibling closest to Jack and the one who, as attorney general, had done whatever it took to protect his brother. He was the only other family member grieving as deeply as Jackie, the only blood Kennedy who could not adhere to the family's mantra, move forward, get on with it, stop feeling sorry for yourself, life is for the living. Bobby, already wiry, began dropping an alarming amount of weight. He too cried all the time. He couldn't sleep either, and now began spending more time at Jackie's, more time with her children than his own. Like Jackie, he bristled when well-meaning people, including his wife Ethel, tried to explain Jack's murder as, quote, God's plan, or suggested that he was now in a better place. Okay, before we get on to the next bet, let me just say this real quick, two things. The first thing is, I don't think this book does an exemplary job of explaining to us how this affair happened, except for the fact that in the photo section, and I will include this photo, there is a picture of Bobby and Ethel walking down the steps, leaving Jackie's house. Bobby has turned back to Jackie, who's standing at the door, and they're grinning at each other like this, like, sort of flirtatious, like, see you later kind of thing, you know? And it's kind of telling. Now, that is by no means hard evidence. <laughs> um, so, uh, unless she says something later that I don't recall, I don't feel like she like really completely stitches together if they were having an affair. They seem oddly close, um, like with him spending so much time at the house, you know, avoiding his own family, wanting to be with her. And you can only imagine that in the late, late nights, the kids are in bed, you're sitting there, you're sad, you know, you're hugging each other, you're sad, you know, I, I just, I can imagine a hundred percent something happening. You know, it's disgusting, it's sordid, it's wrong, but then at the same time, I can see how it happened. And then, you know, there's, if it happened, you know, so that, that's my point number one. Point number two, before we get on to this next section, is that this author is not particularly religious. It feels like from my standpoint, just the various things she said. And so when somebody is not particularly religious, I think that they have a tendency to be a little bit scathing about people of faith. Like they, they think that it's like, you know, kind of weak-minded or just sort of lame, kind of like, you know, look at these, you, you know, you and your sad sack little comforting words about God and, you know, God knows and all this and, you know, God has been a better place. And, you know, these things ring so false to somebody who, who doesn't feel that way or doesn't believe those things. But with that being said, Ethel Kennedy would have driven me crazy. And I am a person who very vehemently is a Christian and unapologetically so and would go out of my way to defend the words that any Christian said about, you know, God comforting you in hard times, because God has been such a comfort to me in hard times. But what Ethel goes on to say here would just ring so false. And even as somebody who believes in God, this would just grate on my soul. The way she expresses it so glibly, like, just get over it, it's fine, you know. He's in the arms of Jesus. Like, that, It even if you believe all those things, that's not necessarily what you want to hear when you're grieving. Like, you have to be allowed to be sad. You know, we can't all just be a sunbeam for Jesus right in the middle of our deepest depression. Sometimes we just need to grieve and we don't need people to try to tell us things to get us past it. Okay, so the book says that faith for Bobby and Jackie had its limits. Jackie was offended when her friend Susan Alsop, one of the rare guests that Jackie hosted during this time, came for tea and offered the consolation that, quote, at least Jack is resting peacefully with God. That's the silliest thing I've ever heard, Susan, Jackie said. Alsop never had a social engagement with Jackie again. Bobby found Ethel's religiosity equally unbearable. When one guest at Hickory Hill brought up a governmental conundrum, Ethel said, well, Jack will take care of that. He's up in heaven and he's looking down on us and he'll show us what to do. That's just stupid. That's so stupid. Like, I, I would have hated that. I, <laughs> that is so dumb, Ethel. Jack's not up there president of heaven. What are you talking about? The voice you just heard, Bobby replied, belongs to the wife of the Attorney General of the United States. Let's hear no more out of her. <laughs> Through late 1963 and early 1964, Bobby was on the verge of quitting public life and never running for elected office. Jackie talked him out of it. When one was in the depths of despair, it was the other who pulled them out. Now that Jack's gone, Jackie wrote to him, Caroline and John need you more than ever. Jack would want us both to carry on what he stood for and died for. After Jack had been interred at Arlington, the two of them restless at the White House that same night, Bobby turned to Jackie and asked, shall we go visit our friend? It was an explicit acknowledgement of this new, terrible, special bond 
Jackie and Bobby the most important people, aside from their children, in Jack's life. There was no room for Ethel here. Jackie and Bobby's affair, which was on and off from 1964 to 1968, was whispered about in their social circles and well-known among the press corps. Jackie and Bobby had been seen dining out in New York City, openly kissing and cuddling, but because it was the Kennedys, because of what happened to Jack and because of Jackie's strength in the days to follow, the secret had been kept. No more. Jackie had left the proverbial compound. So I suppose I'd forgotten that bit about them openly kissing and cuddling in public. That's a one way to go about your grief. If I wanted to take a fair view of this, I would say that I could completely understand how it happened, how their intimacy came about. If both of them are grieving and felt that there was nobody who could understand them the same way the other person could. Makes perfect sense. Um, this terrible indiscretion, though, to take it to the streets and to be, like, openly cuddling and kissing in New York City, like, that's kind of a real slap in the face of, well, Ethel. You know, and Ethel... Mm, I find it interesting this book has no chapter on Ethel, probably because Ethel was so irredeemable that even Maureen Callahan couldn't stitch together a story in which she had been victimized. But anyway, it's just wrong. To assume that the world will give you a pass because you're grieving Kennedy is pretty audacious. But it seems like that's what they did, and it seems like that's what they got. Anyway, no more. Now that Jackie has decided that she's going to team up with this Ario Nassis, the whole world is like, what the actual is happening here? You know, like, of all the things, you'd been a Kennedy, but now you want to go plumbing in the depths of hell for a partner? Like, really? Seriously? Okay, well, Jackie said, if they're killing Kennedys, my children are number one targets and I want to get out of this country. Aristotle Onassis had a private island, a private army, and a yacht the size of a Navy destroyer. It was the spring of 1968, and Jackie was done, as she had told Theodore White all those years before, being the Witter Kennedy. As Bobby's presidential campaign heated up around the same time, he tried to talk her out of the marriage. He had known Onassis for years and hated him. The feeling was mutual. For both personal reasons and business, Onassis worried that if Bobby became president, he would keep Onassis' oil tankers from ever docking in American ports. And Bobby, to Onassis' mind, had had the temerity to call him years prior and tell him to stop sleeping with Jackie's sister, Lee, the princess Radzi well by marriage to Stas. Onassis could not bear the hypocrisy. He knew that Bobby and Jackie Kennedy were both having affairs with Marilyn Monroe. Bobby, Onassis told him, you and Jack, your movie queen, and I'll, my princess. Before Jack was assassinated, Bobby had suspected Jackie of having slept with Onassis despite or because of Lee's involvement with him. He was wild with rage. Tell your Greek boyfriend, Bobby told Jackie. He won't be coming back here until Jack's reelected, long time after, like maybe never. Now Onassis was offering Jackie the one thing Bobby could not, marriage, and the possibility that he was endangering Bobby's presidential chances was something that surely gave the shipping magnate great pleasure. A Jackie R. A. Union would be a public relations disaster. It would make Jackie a Kennedy apostate. It would cast the entire Kennedy family out of Jack's revered legacy and into the realms of gossip and tabloids. For God's sake, Jackie, Bobby said, this could cost me five states. She agreed to wait until after the election. If Bobby won, Ethel would become the next first lady, which would make Jackie, in America, something of a dowager empress, useless, ornamental, second in the family hierarchy, all the more reason to marry Ari. Jackie's next hurdle was her mother-in-law, Rose. Jackie broke the news strategically, calling her sister-in-law Jean Kennedy Smith, who Jackie knew would tell the family. It was smart because Rose was shocked, stunned, she would later say. She, too, know Nassus, but only slightly, and the idea of Jackie choosing Ari after Jack. Ari, this much older man, this garden gnome, a divorced Greek who would now become Caroline and John's stepfather. What was Jackie thinking? And then Rose realized Jackie would never do anything that would hurt the children. She had endured a lot while married to Jack, and now she had the chance at a second chapter, one in which she and her children would be provided for. Rose herself had once wanted a different life, one without her husband, but she had been refused. She did not want that for Jackie, a life frozen in amber. That Jackie wanted Rose's approval meant something, quite a lot, actually. It signals Jackie's desire to remain a family member. It meant that Rose, in being supportive, could continue to have relationships with Caroline and John Jr. So when Jackie finally called her, Rose, without hesitation, gave her blessing. Jackie was blown away. She, of all people, was the one who encouraged me, who said, he's a good man and don't worry, Jackie said. Here I was, I was married to her son and I had his children, but she was the one who was saying, if you think this is best, go ahead. Onassis was Jackie's way out, out of the Kennedy crucible, out of being a living American saint high on a pedestal. 
She wanted to smash that image to bits, break it, destroy it, pulverize it. Marrying Ari would do that, and she could do something for him, too. As she wrote one former lover, Ari, quote, is lonely and wants to protect me from being lonely. Only I can decide if he can, and I decided. I know it comes as a surprise to so many people, but they see things for me that I never wanted for myself. Hmm. Okay, so she married this garden gnome who likes to beat people after sex, and by people, I mean young men. And this is her way of breaking the saint mold that she's been placed in. I feel like there was a, like a lot of different ways she could have gone about this, but you know, to each their own. Ari had been in Jackie's life for a long time. They had first met in the late 1950s when she and Jack accepted his invitation for drinks on his yacht, the Christina O. The Kennedys moved in the same circles as the Winston Churchills, whom Ari also knew, and the infamous Greek wanted to meet this young man who everyone said would become an American president someday. It was Jackie, however, who had impressed him. Years after that initial meeting, he claimed to remember exactly what she was wearing. A white, very simple, very expensive suit, and her movie star demeanor. She had a withdrawn sort of quality, Ari said. It wasn't shyness, it wasn't boredom either. She wasn't conspicuously friendly, but she had a way of making you look at her. Ari invited Jackie for an extended stay on his yacht after the death of baby Patrick, a stay she accepted, much to Jack's chagrin. It turned out to be quite healing for her and was a kindness she never forgot. When Jack was killed, Ari was among the chosen few to stay at the White House in the immediate aftermath. Ari had always seen beneath Jackie's prim veneer to what he called her, quote, carnal soul. He wasn't conventionally attractive like Jackie, but he was highly sexual. Among his favorite possessions was a set of bar stools that he'd had covered in whale scrotum. But mere objects could not compare to acquiring famous women. There's something damned willful about her, Ari said of Jackie, something provocative. Okay, uh, we'll continue, but let me just pause by saying he might have been the only person who could actually see her for what she was. Because I do think she had this very prim, demure exterior. That's what that's how we know Jackie Kennedy. But when you look at the fact that she was acquiring her own set of lovers behind the scenes and that she was moving and shaking to get what she needed uh, or what she thought she needed to feel whole, you know, sh she was no wallflower about it. I think the more interesting story about Jackie is the fact that she has, she had this whole other life going on behind this, under the surface and behind the scenes. And yet she managed to keep everybody thinking that she was just this prim, proper young lady, but who really was over there having any number of her own lovers. I mean, I don't even know how many she has. Like, is there a book about that? You know, and I'm not saying that it's really any of my business. Well, really, is any of this my business? No. Um, and I don't think that I would waste my time reading a book about all her lovers. All I'm saying is I think that Ari saw the truth about her. Um, I saw that she was not somebody who didn't know what she wanted in the bedroom and was willing to go looking for it. I mean, you know, Jack never really was clued into that because he was kind of, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And, you know, often done with it. But she, by her own admission, was over there reading books to educate herself about what she wanted. And then it would appear that she found people who could help her figure that out. Anyway, the book says that he knew that the Beaumont thought him crude. Fortunately, people with class are usually willing to overlook this flaw, he said, because I am very rich. Upon her engagement to Anastasia, that's what the world now thought of Jackie. Crude. Ari was her sugar daddy. Daddy-o. Jackie and Ari could claim a second shot at love all they wanted. But this marriage was also transactional. The merger of two global brands, and no woman could compete with the widow Kennedy, who had a commensurate number in mind. Her financial advisor, Andre Mayer, proposed that Ari pay $20 million to make the marriage happen. Your client, Onassis told Mayer, could price herself right out of the market. Jackie wound up getting $3 million up front from Ari. That's a come down from that $20 million. Another $1 million for each of her children and $600,000 a year for travel, millions more in the event of divorce or Ari's death, and stipulations as to how many times a year she would be required to sleep with him. Well, this is really a love letter, isn't it? I'll marry you for $3 million. Uh, you need to give me a million each for my kids, 600000 a year for travel, and there has to be something in this contract about how many times I have to sleep with you, you little garden gnome. She also insisted on separate bedrooms at shared residences, though theirs would be a marriage in every sense, save children. On that, they agreed. On October 20th, 1968, Jackie wed Ari on his private island of Scorpios. Wearing a high-necked, knee-length white Valentino dress, her hair pulled back in a half-ponytail and tied off with a white ribbon. 
It was a rebuke to the church that had denounced her, dressing like a young girl taking her first communion, and to everyone who thought that she was greedy or gone mad. No, Jacqueline Kennedy was quite in her right mind. She was a middle-aged icon who had rewritten her first husband's problematic history and had just negotiated a marriage contract containing 170 clauses. Most importantly, she had successfully killed off her former incarnation. Jackie Onassis would be a different person entirely. Let the world recoil in disgust. All the better. All the more freedom for her. So I think Ari was right. I mean, I think that she had in her this streak of rebelliousness, this ability to manipulate people's interpretation of her. Initially, it had been to her fortune to get people to buy into this demure, prim, uh, clean-lined, lovely image um, because that benefited her. And now she doesn't need people's attention anymore. She does, In fact, she doesn't want it. She wants people to get off her back and stop deciding how she is and telling her who she is, although she's the one who created that image in the first place, though she has only herself to blame. But... Now she has the ability to manipulate people's idea of her to push them away from her. So really she was always the one piloting this plane, you know, it wasn't that, oh, you know, she got depressed and, you know, slipped and let everybody just, you know, hate her because she was making bad decisions. I think she wanted people to hate her. I think she was fine with that. Just like she had been fine when she needed people's acceptance. Now she wants them to make their distance. Jackie needs a small scandal to bring her alive, Ari said at the time. The world loves fallen grandeur. And he was right. Jackie was reanimated, as was the public's fascination with her. Gone were the prim lady jackets and bouffants, the bras too. Jackie O was dressing for a new era, the dawning of the 1970s. She was shedding her old skin while casting back to the ambitions of her youth, her dreams of becoming a great writer someday, known not for whom she married, but for what she did and how she worked. Why do people always try to see me through the different names I've had at different times? She asked in 1972. People often forget that I was Jacqueline Bouvier, before being Mrs. Kennedy or Mrs. Onassis. She was modern now in her tight white capris and tissue-thin black tees, her nipples poking through. She strolled the streets of Greece and Italy barefoot. She wore her long hair loose and parted down the middle, wrapped in a chic low ballet bun. She adopted two accessories that would be named after her, a slouchy Gucci horse bit handbag and enormous black sunglasses that obscured half her face. The effect was pure garbo. Look at me, don't look at me. I can't bear if you don't look at me. New York City Jackie O was a variation on the theme, a long black belted leather trench coat her armor. This Jackie O was a dominatrix. She was entering the most openly sexual chapter of her life. She was no longer the woman Jack Kennedy had humiliated. In marrying Ari, she had publicly triumphed. If only she felt that way in private. Nearly one month to the day after her second wedding, Jackie, in Greece with Ari's sister Artemis, broke down. It was November 22, 1968, the fifth anniversary of Jack's assassination. In all that time, she hadn't been able to stop talking about that day in graphic detail. It was like a compulsion and an attempted exorcism, as if enough people knew and could understand, then Jackie wouldn't be so alone, so fundamentally apart from everyone else. It was hopeless. I'm a freak, she would say. I'm, I'll always be a freak. Sometimes I think I'll never be able to be truly happy again. She had aged rapidly. One woman who met Jackie in this era was shocked. Jackie, as ever, photographed beautifully, but those big sunglasses were obscuring tiny lines and cracks, her face a spider web of anguish. She suffered excruciating, pulsating pain in her neck, which she believed was permanent nerve damage from clutching Jack's shattered head in her lap. The horrors of that day lived in her body, on her face, and in her nightmares. But she tries to shield all this pain, this physical pain and this mental pain, uh, by surrounding herself with beautiful things and by luxuriating in the spoiling that she gets from Ari, because Ari was all about spoiling her, at least at the beginning. That's going to change. But at the beginning, it was all about giving his wife everything she wanted and expecting nothing of her. You know, she could do whatever she wanted. Um, and it would seem that she was uh, quite particular about what it was that she wanted. The book says that Ari spoiled Jackie. Expensive jewels were nestled on her breakfast tray. She lunched, she sunbathed, she did yoga by the pool and shopped extravagantly. As in the White House, she demanded that her bed linens, she had 12 pairs of hand-embroidered Italian pink sheets that she traveled with all the time. Um, and they had to be cleaned and ironed every morning and every afternoon after her daily nap. What is it with these super rich people who have to have the bed 
re-ironed after their naps. Like this is not the first person we read about who was like this. You know who else was like that? Wallace Simpson. She also demanded that the bed be ironed, that the sheets be ironed after her nap in the afternoon. And to this, I also have to say, just as a side note, we all recall the story from earlier in the book when Jackie goes to get in the bed and finds some nasty undies in her bed. But this says that when she was married to Ari, just as it had been in the White House, she expected that the bed be remade for her twice a day, in the morning and in the afternoon, and the sheets be cleaned and ironed both times. So how did those underwear stay in the bed? Do you know what I mean? So one of these stories is not 100%. Anyway, she was fascinated by Greece and Greek culture, yet often found herself touring ruins and antiquities alone. Her new husband, she suspected, already bored with his latest acquisition and secretly romancing his old flame, the famous opera singer Maria Callas. Callas, who had been photographed with Marilyn Monroe, the night of the Madison Square Garden disgrace. What a overlap in tragedies. There were still days when Jackie couldn't get out of bed. Oh, how the tabloids loved this detail. Jackie O, oh, spoiled and lolling her days away, wasting time, killing time, nothing else going on in that head, but where to fly next or what to buy next or what she was doing to the Kennedy legacy. No one saw it for what it was, deep depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. No one on earth, not even the woman whose husband was killed while trying to arrest Jack's assassin, could relate to what Jackie had been through. Not the scale or scope of it, the enormous burden that came with carrying Jack's legacy. The shrinks, the pills, the vodka and cigarettes took the edge off sometimes. But then she'd suddenly find herself back in Texas, her husband's brains exploding all over her lap, she herself exposed to another gunshot. So what if she shopped? So what? Part of it was her natural acquisitiveness, sure. Jackie liked nice things. But there was also the fear of poverty drilled into her from early childhood by her mother, whose own second marriage was driven by the need for financial security. Deep down, Jackie held the irrational fear that no matter how much money she had, it would never be enough. Side note, that's not a Jackie Kennedy Onassis distinction. Most rich people continue the hustle because they're afraid that they that it'll go away, that they won't have enough, that you always think, you know, when I get to this amount of money, then I'll be set. But you get there and it's not, you know, and there's always the fear that like, well, what if it all goes away? What if I lose it somehow? Irrational maybe, but it's such a common fear that most people have. Jackie's existential dread that no one would ever really know or understand her could be quelled for a little while with things. So could her anxiety that at any moment Ari might tire of her, the lady's acquisition in his empire. She exacted her revenge by running up his credit cards at the world's most expensive department stores and design houses, buying doubles and triples and secretly reselling half her purchases at a profit. This whole marriage is like the weirdest. Even if they want to say that it was a marriage, like it was a true marriage, how could it be when it's so transactional and so sort of like secretly buying all this stuff on his credit card and then selling it at a profit, like, and then maybe putting that money in her own secret bank accounts. Like, what is this? No matter the conventional wisdom about the gold digging Jackie O, every woman still wanted to look like her, to be her. She became an icon even in the punk scene, where the Boston band Human Sexual Response paid tribute to her in a song called Jackie Onassis. I want to be Jackie Onassis. I want to wear a pair of dark sunglasses. Okay, so that is right in the middle of this current chapter we're reading. The next time we read, it is going to be explosive about the denigration of their relationship, mostly because of the way he treated her. Now, I think Jackie probably would have stayed with him, um, not just because he, you know, was a blank check, but because there was not very much expected of her in that relationship. Um, but the way he ends up treating her like so much garbage and trash, um, his need to demean her would have been more than anybody could bear. And he was very gross in the way he treated her. So we're going to talk about that in the next chapter. We're going to talk about how uh, their relationship deteriorated and then what did she do afterwards and what, uh, you know, her, her desire to become a working woman and to make her own money. Not that she needed the money, but just she wanted to do it. She wanted to live out another dream of hers. Now that she had been married to all the famous men, now that she'd had all of that experience and done what the world had told her to do, now she wants to do what she had wanted to do. So next chapter is going to be very gritty. Um, Onassis was gross. Um, so just prepare yourself for that. Um, and I'll see you guys later this week. Thanks so much for listening. Bye.